Aloha and welcome to 21.3 degrees north. I'm Jennifer Killinger, your host for today and every day. Today we're going to be focusing on the topic of invasive species. But in order to understand what an invasive species is, we first must go over a couple other terms. In Hawaii, it's really important to know what an invasive species is, how to identify it, and then what you can do about it. In order to fully understand what an invasive species is, we must first understand what a native species is and what an alien species is. These things are kind of a continuum. You start on one end with the natives, and on the other end you have the invasives. But somewhere in between, you've got the alien species. The native species is a species that originally resides in an ecosystem, historically lived there in the past, or it currently resides there. The alien species is a species that's not native, but it is able to produce offspring in this new environment. So it's something that was introduced. An alien species isn't always negative. For example, cattle, potatoes, and other domesticated uh, produce items or um, stock feed are definitely alien because they're not from that area, but they're not considered invasive because they're not causing harm. In order to be considered invasive, you must be an alien species that has the potential to cause harm or is causing harm to the ecosystem, to the habitat, to um, the economy, or to human health. When the alien species somehow has mechanisms for survival that allow it to consume more resources in the environment than the natives that originally lived there, it then passes into what we call an invasive species. So invasive species are introduced into habitats in a multitude of ways. Uh, sometimes travelers will bring them in knowingly or unknowingly. For example, the snails that we're going to talk about in a little while. Uh, people smuggle different things in. Um, sometimes they're large animals, other times maybe insects. And oftentimes it's also lizards and reptiles and fish. There are multiple ways that aquatic animals get transported into new areas. One way that organisms are um, introduced into coastal regions is through the ballast water. When ships come into port, they often will let out their ballast water and they'll have the organisms from wherever it was that they pumped the water in. So there are some precautions that are being taken for this, some rules that are made. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard is requiring um, the ocean ballast water exchange to happen in the open ocean. So how it will work is you are at your own coast and you don't have any cargo. So you pump in all this water to your ballast tanks and then it holds it so that you have a steady trip. And then when you get out into the ocean, you let all that water out and then you pump new water in and you do this, uh, it must be three times the ballast tank capacity. So basically three full times you have to um, kind of circulate the water to try to flush out all the zooplankton and other organisms that may have hitched a ride from your original coast line. So then when you get to your new coast, you have open ocean water, which has organisms that are way less likely to survive in the new coastal region. So while ballast water is an ongoing concern for invasive species, there are some precautions that you can take to avoid contaminating the coasts. There's also landscaping. Uh, that's, a, you know, you, you have this yard and you want to do something really pretty with it, and so you pick all these flowers from the nursery nearby, or you order them online and you bring them in, and they may look really nice, but they may be causing problems in the habitat, and then they could spread from there. Birds eat the seeds and then spread them, and then that can be an introduction of an invasive species. And one more way that's just so much fun, why are invasive species introduced? Sometimes it's completely on purpose. Here in Hawaii, we've got the mongoose. The mongoose was introduced because we had a rat problem, and they thought, oh, well, the mongoose can eat the rats. So they brought the mongoose in. What happened was they have completely opposite sleep schedules. So the mongoose are out during the day hunting and eating all this stuff, causing new problems, and the rats are out at night 
eating all the same stuff they used to eat before and causing the same problems. So now we have two completely separate problems when we were just trying to fix the one that we had. So you remember those snails I mentioned a little bit ago? It's the giant African snail. Uh, travelers brought them in in the 30s, actually, the mid-30s. So you may be wondering, well, what's so bad about these snails? They're kind of cool. They're these big snails. They're just going to crawl around, maybe eat some leaves or something, right? Well, let me tell you, <laughs> there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, somebody wanted to use them for medicine. He, um, he had this idea that you could take these snails and let them crawl over your face, and this, this would be a beauty treatment. And, well... Actually, you can get quite sick from these creatures because they crawl on all kinds of stuff that you don't want on your face. The African snail is also a carrier of the rat lungworm parasite, which causes meningitis that can infect and even kill humans. So if you're ever to handle these, you should be wearing gloves. Another reason why you shouldn't have them crawling across your face, right? <laughs> and also another lady, she brought them in uh, she thought they were really pretty and they were, I mean, they are pretty. They were these big giant snails and she thought they'd look nice in her garden. And um, well, what happens with them? They breed like crazy. One single snail can have thousands of babies and they can uh, mate and then hold the sperm inside until later. Mating happens, they both can be pregnant. So you have now two snails that can have thousands of babies. So not only are these a serious plant pest because they eat everything in sight and a public nuisance, but since it has the ability and potential to spread such parasitic diseases, it ranks in the top 10 major pests in the United States. And then the United States, you might ask, but you only told us about Hawaii. Right, but there are other areas that this little guy has gotten to. Florida, for example, that's where they were eating houses. The, Florida has a lot of stucco houses, and that's where the snails were eating the entire wall. Uh, they had their introduction in the 60s as well, and they were, were able to trace it back to an elementary school kid that brought two of them in his pocket. And he had them, he actually brought them from Hawaii, and he took them to Miami, and it took them 10 years 17,000 snails were collected and killed and it was over a million dollars <laughs> damn snails so with one snail that maybe it bred before it got here that one snail can produce a thousand offspring and that's why one single invasive species brought in can be such a danger. As previously mentioned, uh, releasing aquarium fish into a water system is a very common introduction for an aquatic species. But there are also other ways that these little guys get released into the area. Sometimes it's a purposeful introduction, like what happened with the mongoose in Hawaii, there are also reasons why people see fit to release fish into the lake or river system in their area. We'll tell you about a little place called Clear Lake. In Clear Lake, California, they have periodic algal blooms in the lake that clog everything up. It's just these thick, nasty mats of this algae, and they're trying to find a way to deal with it. So they thought, well, why don't we introduce this fish that really likes to eat this algae. So they brought in the silver sides. Now these guys are tiny, they're 15 centimeters. And the natives in the lake, they're about 23 centimeters. Because the little guys eat so much, they ended up not only eating all of the algae, but then they started eating all the algae that the other fish would eat as well. And so before long, they completely wiped out a couple populations of the native fish and severely damaged the populations of others. And then they spread from there up all the streams and rivers in far distances away from the little lake where they were introduced. So while it's perfectly understandable to want to get rid of a problem in your area, you never know what's gonna happen when you introduce a new species into a region. 
So we've seen how animals can be the invasive species introduced into an ecosystem and how they can end up changing that, but also plants can cause major changes. Another example of an introduction of an invasive species would almost be comical if it weren't so true. Uh, a couple businessmen decided back in the 70s that they wanted to start a new business on Oahu uh, trying to see if they could harvest carrageenan from algae that they started to grow here. So they brought in Gracilaria and Capophycus and they introduced them into Waikiki and Kaneohebe and then they just let them grow. Capophycus is a species native to the Philippines and Gracilaria is native to the Indian Ocean and South Pacific. These types of algae were introduced into Kaneohe Bay and Honolulu Harbor. Carrageenan is a chemical component that occurs naturally in algae, which helps for gelling, thickening, and stabilizing foods. It can be quite a profitable business if done correctly. Unfortunately, our little businessmen over on Oahu failed miserably. But they did not clean up all of the algae that they planted. And so this algae thrived and took over entire areas of the island. So all of these seaweeds just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. These algae took over the entire Kaneohe Bay. I don't know if you've ever been out there, but if you go out there and check, you'll just see just big chunks of this stuff. And the same thing in Waikiki. Uh, when you see, they kind of look like tumbleweeds and they get, um, yanked off the rocks and they sweep up into the beachy areas and then they just kind of sit there and get hot and kind of gross. So again, a common question is, why should we care? It's just a little seaweed. It's kind of pretty. It tumbles around like a tumbleweed. What's wrong with that? Well, every single little piece of that tumbleweed can break apart and grow. It's called uh, reproduction through fragmentation. And that means that it can spread anywhere that the currents can take it. And that's another reason why these guys are so dangerous. So there's a difference between microalgae and macroalgae. The microalgae are the tiny littler ones that kind of get all up in the nooks and crannies but don't completely take over the space. And the macroalgae will grow right over those. Uh, the microalgae also work in uh, partnership with the coral and they don't block out in the sunlight and they actually help provide nutrition for the coral so it's a nice symbiotic relationship. With the macroalgae such as Gracilaria and Capophycus, they just bombard right over everything and they will kind of smother the coral so the coral can't access the nutrients in the water column. Both of these types of red algae grow thick and gnarly mats that smother the coral and reduce access to the crevices and holes that the creatures live in and feed in and thereby reduces the diversity of the coral reef as a whole and the uh, little spaces that would provide refuge for fish from predators uh, so there's no longer that protection and when the reef is covered in these types of seaweed the fish no longer frequent the area because they don't use this algae as a food source and so nearby fisheries as well as the local fishermen as well as the habitat as a whole is impacted by the introduction of these two invasive algae species Capophycus and Gracilaria. So you may wonder, what can we do about it? Well, there's this thing called the super sucker and it's a, a huge hose and they take it out into Kaneohe Bay and they, uh, the divers dive down and they pick these chunks of algae and they put them into the hose and the hose sucks it all up into the boat and then dumps it out into this area and there's this net that kind of catches all the algae and then people are up there and they're sorting through and picking out the native algae and putting it back and then taking all the invasive algae and then hauling it out. And there are also um, algae cleanups in Waikiki and I've been a part of those and we collect those, you know, huge uh, garbage bins. We, we collect those, like so many of them, 
hundreds of pounds of algae every time we go out with big groups of people and it's really nice to be a part of the community and to be helping the ecosystem in your area and bringing the habitat into a more natural state. And there are ways you can get involved. The experts will coordinate with the counties and try to increase the resources and funding to address these issues and to increase the public awareness and to get um, all the people involved, whether it be agencies or the public or the mayor's office and invasive species committees. Like nearly every single major city has invasive species committees working on things like this. So we try to get everybody to work together to um, target the species that are causing the most damage and then eradicate them, control them. As of March 30th this year, 2014, there has been a bill introduced to attempt at eradicating or controlling invasive species. Over on Big Island, the cokey frog and fire ant are both big problems. The Senate Bill 2347 is an attempt to control the spread of invasive species to the local agriculture industry. But of course with any new bills being introduced there are two sides and so some people think that it won't do what it says it's going to do and other people think that it will and then there's also the conflict of the money involved where if they are not being able to ship the product then they may not be making the money that they could. So even when we have solutions, we still have to all work together to understand what can come up from those solutions that may create a new problem. That's all it really is, is just trying to solve the problems without creating bigger problems. So there's gotta be the decision makers. They have the authority and the means to offer support or enact the regulations needed. Uh, the, spe the special interest groups that play an important role in the introduction of the invasive species or the ones that promote or observe the invasive species, scientists and transportation agencies and landscaping companies. And then there's the general public. In order to raise awareness and concern, we've got to get everybody involved. And most importantly are the students, the next generation, the people that are going to be taking on the problems that are being established now. If we can uh, show them these problems now and then they can work on ways to prevent more spreading of invasive species. So uh, the involvement comes from all around and it really takes the whole community to uh, battle the invasive species problem. If invasive species is something that you are really interested in knowing more about, there is no more valuable website than USGS.gov. That's the U.S. Geological Survey. So look up USGS.gov online. You can find tons of really, really good information no matter where you live. Uh, in Hawaii, there's the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. And there's also the Hawaii Early Detection Network. And they have so much information and if you want to know what you can do, you can also look there. They have volunteer coordination and links to send you for places in your area and local information. So first you want to investigate and see, is this an invasive species? So you look online and you try to identify what it is and you inspect this and you compare your specimen to the photos and descriptions. and and then you can collect a sample and you can take pictures or you can actually physically collect that sample and report it. You can use online, in person, or by phone to 643-PEST. That's 643-PEST for invasive species in Hawaii. Some of the invasive species here on Oahu are quite adorable, like the veiled chameleon. He's the guy that has the little eyeballs like this that can kind of point every which way and then he's got his little toes claws that are kind of like this and he's got these really cool stripes and they make good pets and people really like them and but they are invasive so if you do have one as a pet please do not ever let it go if you get tired of taking care of it please get it to a friend who would like a pet or call that number I keep giving you what was it? 643 pest uh, also the gold dust 
day geckos. They are the gorgeous green ones with all those bright orange colors and they just light up everything when you see them. They're so beautiful. They don't even look real. Unfortunately, they too are invasive. I, I have a friend who has one of those living in his house, eating all the bugs in the house. So it's working for him. But if they were outside, it would be a different story because they would be impacting the environment outside. The Jackson's chameleon is also a very adorable invasive species located here on Oahu. It's, um, it's very similar in style to the veiled chameleon. They both are able to take over because they feed on the endemic snails. Endemic means that they live only here because they evolved here and they're very specialized to the environment. So they have a very special place and the Jackson's chameleons are taking over that place when they're out in the wild. However, they make adorable pets. So have you ever been on a hike and found those little tiny, uh, they're called strawberry guavas? Those are actually invasive as well, which is kind of sad because they're very tasty, but they do impact the surrounding environment by sucking up nutrients that are supposed to be taken up by the native plants, and they do displace some of the foliage here in Hawaii. So hopefully now you understand a little bit more about invasive species and how to get involved with controlling the populations and preventing them from being established in the first place. So thanks for tuning in to 21.3 Degrees North and learning about invasive species today. Hopefully you learned more about how to do your part to keep our areas and our islands free of the nasty little buggers, or at least keep them confined into your home if they're your pets, and enjoy the wildlife that we have here in Hawaii. Aloha! Who left that giraffe in here?